Welcome, everyone. This is your main host, Rulo Kuchishnik, again with another episode. And it's been a while since I had a junior show. Um, I'm sorry, Rudolph. My sound is um, uh, something's up with the sound. It's uh, can't hear very well. But do you hear me now, or am I? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Now I can hear you. Okay, great. I was introducing you to my audience, and I said that it was very great to have you on. And I haven't done a show in a while, so I think we will have a terrific show tonight, you and I. And I've been thinking. Um, what I want to discuss with you is the latest events happening in Ukraine, in Ukraine at this very moment, and also a little bit to touch upon the video that you did about the current colonization of Palestine, what is actually happening now from the Israeli point of view. And, and also we can tie this into where we are heading at, um, if you look at European politics in general, I know there are a lot of topics to ventilate with you because you are a super interesting guest to have you on, but I'm very glad to finally get a chance to do a show with you. How about these topics, my friend? How does that sound? Uh, sounds great to me, and I'm glad to be back because uh, you're, you're, I feel the same way about you. You're an excellent host, uh, packed full of uh, invaluable information. So it's always a pleasure to do these shows with you. Great. I'm so happy. So what we have seen so far is this, you know, we hear from the U.S. government point of view that the Russians are mobilizing at the Ukrainian border. We see several, we see 100,000 Russian soldiers mobilizing. And uh, obviously also they have evacuated the embassy staff from Kiev, the U.S. embassy staff and so on. So what are your thoughts? Do you think that we will see some kind of confrontation? Because I want to reserve this with a caveat. You know, on the one hand, we already have tensions between Ukraine and Russia. We already see the energy prices spike. You know, the dollar, let, let, let's say the um, price for uh, crude oil is almost $90 per barrel. That's reaching all time high. You know, it's it's. We're going into the energy prices are spiking at this very moment. So if we have a confrontation between two, these two powers, well, then we will have another financial crisis, definitely. Any thoughts on your way of uh, analyzing and so on? Give me your uh, opinion. Uh, yeah, this is a very alarming situation. And uh, my heart goes out to the, the Ukrainian people. Uh, they have been under... Um, under one guise or another, they've been under the Russian control for uh, centuries, uh, whether it was the Soviet Union or prior to that, the Russian Empire. I don't know what their sentiments were uh, towards Russia during the uh, reign of the czars, but we know from um, the Soviet times, the Ukrainians do not want anything to do with Russia in terms of being one unified country with them. And um, it, it, so it's, it's, that's, it's a sad situation for the average Ukrainian who probably mm. wants independence. But I feel as though the um, government was, um, the, you had the, the whole coup in uh, 2014. And, and, mm -hmm. and, and don't get me wrong, I heard, um, the, what was the prior uh, leader? Was it Yanukovych? Yanukovych, I, you know, Yanukovych heard, yes, Viktor yeah. Yanukovych. Right, right. And, and I've heard, you know, he wasn't, uh, a stellar leader, but it looks like he was able to, um, I call it, um, he was, not just me, this is a saying we have, he, he was able to thread the needle between East and West and mm -hmm. keep these sort of situations from not happening. What we have right now is uh, Victoria Newlands, the result of her coup d'etat in 2014 when she was with the, the Obama administration. And yes, tensions are high. I think the Russians, I, I don't, I don't want to be hyperbolic, but I think Russia has had its uh, back put against the wall, so to speak, because here you have yeah. uh, my government here in the United States um, not giving them a guarantee that Ukraine uh, will will join NATO. That's that's the, I think the linchpin. But uh, at the same time, they're moving in uh, weapons, and it, it's just it's. I think it it can. I, I'm leaning towards um, 
maybe 70 percent of me thinks that the Russians will do some sort of military action. Uh, to what extent? I'm not sure. I'm thinking maybe they'll uh, take the entire uh, Black Sea region. Yes. And, uh, yes. A, a that's big, a good point. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm, that's what I'm thinking they're going to do. And perhaps um, some of the east, like, you know, probably just a few kilometers away from the capital. Uh, just just to ensure that. Uh, yeah, because, because we, we live in it. OK, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, no. I just want to say because the current contingency right now, they don't have the capacity to take over Kiev. Definitely. I know that there are a lot of people exaggerating the, the power of Russia. And with the current contingency, they don't have the capacity to take over Kiev. Because we also have the, because Kiev has also very strong conventional forces that will be able to put up uh, fierce resistance against any types of Russian invasion plans. Now, what I want to tell to the audience listening in now that this conflict is paradigmatic to what happened in Croatia during the 1990s. We had also a Serbian mobilization, let's say Serbian para paramilitaries in the province of Kraina uh, that wanted to separate from Croatia and integrate with Serbia. Exactly the same pattern that we have with these separatists, you know, trying to carve out Donbass region and integrate it with Russia, like this conception of Nova Russia. So we see the same types of similarities here. Albeit, right, right. I, I, I'll, albeit I'm going to reserve it. I think, Lamar, you nailed it quite good. They have some kind of, let's say, irredentist plans to t carve out some pieces of Ukraine and have it under Russian control. That is for sure. So I think that might actually happen. It, it, right, right. And, um, and those uh, separatists you mentioned, they, they even have a flag already for their um, their fledgling republic. Um, and, and so it, it's really serious. I think that part of, of, of Ukraine will definitely be lost. And, and yes, they have to secure because a lot of people don't realize, uh, and, and I've seen this on the documentary recently, the Crimean Peninsula uh, water resources are being restricted by, by the... Um, the the territory that's remained with with uh, the rest of the country. So, and in order to um, ensure you know the, the Crimea has access to these water resources, they're going to have to take uh, portions uh, that you know the southern portion of the country, and uh, and they probably want the rest of the the, the coast, the Black Sea coast, so they exactly. they don't have to worry about any NATO vessels. Uh, in in that particular, you know, in, in the northern portion of the Black Sea, of and course, um, I think they also want to shore yeah. up uh, their their borders uh, in the Caucasus Caucasus region as well. Uh, it, it's it's so many uh, parts. Uh, it's a very vulnerable area strategically for for Russia. Uh, you had some thoughts. I'm sorry. No, I just want to say that what we heard for so long since this invasion since 2014 i heard the alt right saying oh you know it's these oligarchs belonging to the special lobby groups what i like to call the cuban americans you know so i don't get censored <laughs> yeah. so so the, cuban, right, yeah. the so so the cuban americans they have a vested interest they don't want, they, they are seek a confrontation with Russia. On the other hand, I try to tell people that you have a Cuban-American influence, a lot, you know, invested with the Putin government too, like Mikhail Friedman and many more of him, like, yeah, 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 many more of these, of these oligarchs also, you know, around Vladimir Putin too. And I try to tell, I try to tell people that they don't care, the Cuban Americans, if, if these peoples go to war with each other, as long as just they profit from this. And this is typical of modus operandi of these lobby groups. They, they support one side and then support the others in order for them to strengthen themselves. Do you agree on this? Because I have seen this pattern too in the Middle East. Go ahead, my friend. Oh yes, I uh, I definitely agree with that. You know, not only in the Middle East, but if we go back to World War One, uh, the, the same Cuban Americans 
had both sides uh, of that yeah. conflict heavily indebted. Yes. So no matter who, no matter who would have won, the war exactly. reparations and the penalties would have been steep, severe, and it would have benefited this uh, this same Cuban American lobby. <laughs> yeah. So they can conduct their, uh, not only that they can conduct colonialism, but we're talking about colonialism in eternity. This is, this is the most horrifying thing. But th- th- that's, w- that's why I want to jump quick into also what the brilliant video that you did about the current colonization in the Middle East. It's one tiny enclave that is totally colonized and subjected to brutal apartheidism. So we want to talk a little bit about that too. Give me your brief thoughts on this, my friend. Go ahead. Right, right. The, um, the, you know, despite there being international law and many uh, UN resolutions passed against, um, you know, now we're talking about the Cuban Americans who, who live in that territory uh, between the Mediterranean Sea, Jordan, Syria, and the Sinai exactly. Peninsula. That's what we're talking about now. And, you know, and any other nation that did any of these practices would be instantly demonized. You would see a nonstop media. Let's take South Africa, for example. You know, South Africa, from from my reading, they actually did less than what these Cuban Americans are doing. But Lamar, sorry, sorry to cut you off, Lamar, but South Africa was a regional power in Africa. But this is even more a tiny state. So the fact that right. they can get away with it is even more horrifying. The, the, these darn Cuban Americans, what they can get away with it is quite unbelievable. It, don't, don't you think? Yes, yes. And I mean, right, right now what they're doing is, um, uh, the, again, despite international law, they've, um, they went on wars of conquest. And when you, uh, you're not supposed to be able to occupy territory or start, um, initiate wars. And they've done, uh, just a quick example, they've bombed Syria well over 400 times since 2015, a country yes. that is not even, uh, even threatened to attack their territory. Even territory that they occupy in the Golan Heights, the Syrian government, yes. uh, prior to this uh, civil war that was imposed on it, they kept their side from attacking uh, occupied territory. The Golan Heights actually belongs to Syria. Uh, of course, but, since 1967. You know, right. And, and they haven't even attacked that. They have not tried to reclaim that territory, but, uh, let alone uh, offensively attack, uh, you know. But Islam. Lamar, what is so interesting that they see it is their natural, naturalized borders. So the Golan Heights, it's not even in any kind of discussion to hand it over back to Syria. It's just a natural element belonging to a tiny state which has the most powerful lobby, and it's naturally the Cuban Americans. Go ahead, my friend. Right, right. And this lobby, as as you mentioned, because I was one of those people um, you you mentioned before. This is how I actually stumbled across your channel, because... I was under the same uh, delusion of the alt right. I thought, you know, it looks like Russia is the good guy. They're the, the positive alternative. They're not internationalists. They're, you have a nationalist government that's looking exactly. out for the Russian people. Yet, um, the the same the same uh, Cuban American lobby that um, punches well above its weight here in the United oh, States yes. is, is is the same there. Are you even up, up to the extent of the chief uh, religious leader? of that community in Russia actually said it's never been a better time to be a Cuban American in Russia. He actually said exactly. they're pretty popular there. So, you know, what not only <laughs> that, you have a Valery, Valery Kogan, Mikhail Friedman. It's all Hispanic names, you know, definitely. And, <laughs> and also right. you have the biggest religious community that have in, invested interest all over the world Chabad Lubavitch, and they have a strong, extremely strong presence in in the Russian Federation, which I don't understand why these alt rights support the Russian Federation. It makes me, it just makes my stomach hurt so much when I hear this. Go ahead, my friend. Any any thoughts on what I said? 
Uh, yeah, and, and I could add to that um, one of the, um, I guess, one of Putin's uh, top advisors. Some people call him his brain. And you, you know him. Um, you introduced me. Alexander Dugin actually uh, said that. And, and the crazy part is uh, he actually said that what they're trying to do is create a Eurasia and a Eurasian man. They're not necessarily uh, looking out for white Russians. He actually said it would be of great course. if Russia could be like uh, ancient Egypt. You know, and, and we know ancient Egypt was like an amalgamation of uh, several different phenotypes. So it's um, it's astounding that, uh, you know, you would have people from the alt-right who would actually uh, be under this spell still, despite uh, all the evidence to the contrary. It's um, pretty my brother, I just Well, my brother, I just want to say I am so happy to do a show with you. I'm super enthusiastic about this. I'm going to give you another analogy. You mentioned Mr. Alexander Dugin, who is somehow the chief ideologist behind this. But I'm going to give you another example that is even more shocking. The great Russian nationalist Vladimir Chirinovsky, who, who seeks to create a great Russia, who cares for the greater Russia. Well, he is half Cuban-American, too, from his father. <laughs> You know, and he said that wow. he will pledge allegiance to that tiny state who is conducting the most atrocious act on the face of the planet. And bear in mind, this is very important. This tiny state who is conducting these atrocious acts is not a superpower, is not a great power, but it's a tiny state in the Middle East and it's managed to get away with virtually anything it does when it comes to breaking human rights, conduct vicious war crimes and so on. Nobody cares. And why is right. that? We need, we... Exactly. Extrajudicial killings like, the, like uh, for instance, the Udba did, the Secret Service of Yugoslavia and so on. But nevertheless, Yugoslavia was the fourth regional power in Europe. But this tiny state is, is able to get away with everything. And we have to ask ourselves why this is the case. Go ahead, my uh, friend. And, and, yeah, 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 go it, ahead. They, they have a significant amount of uh, money and financial influence. I mean, uh, the last time I checked, they said the stock market is worth approximately $35 trillion, uh, if I'm not mistaken. And a significant portion of that belongs to them. They actually, yes. um, the, the, the four horsemen of, of banking here in the United States um, collude with the four horsemen of oil, and um, which is why this same minority also has a lot of clout and power in countries that are supposed to be their arch nemesis, uh, like Saudi Arabia. They're actually um, heavily uh, indebted to and in bed with uh, the, this country in the Middle East. And uh, to, to the extent that they're helping them uh, commit war crimes in Yemen, they're, they're actually um, building an intelligence gathering center on an island uh, between the Arabian Peninsula and the Horn of Africa, uh, known as Socotra, which is a uh, part of Yemen. But um, with the help of the United Arab Emirates, they're building one of the uh, largest uh, 1984 spy bases in that region on this island. That Keep in mind, this island um, has uh, world heritage sites because, because there are plants and animals that don't exist. Uh, anywhere else in the world on this uh, island. It's supposed to be protected. Uh, no one's supposed to be paving it or, um, you know, modernizing it. It's, it's actually supposed to be a nature preserve for the most part. But we know that they don't have to um, follow international law. They've assassinated uh, countless uh, uh, opponents. I recently saw that um, there was a, a gentleman. He was actually a Canadian. I can't recall his name, but he developed a, a super um, gun. It was a art, conventional artillery. It wasn't going to fire any, um, you know, intercontinental ballistic missiles, but he actually developed an artillery piece that could actually reach from Iraq to Israel. And guess what happened to this guy? He was assassinated before he could uh, go to Iraq and, and work on the super gun uh, forces. So, if if you run afoul of this group, I mean, uh, they will or, or they'll they'll stifle free speech. They've had sure, uh, individual sure. individuals. One of their um, <laughs> holy of holies is is the um, is the event that they claim happened during the Second World War. I'm not going to mention it uh, out yes, of fear of yeah. censorship. 
But they have many European. We know. We know many, this thing. Yeah, can, Sorry, I don't want to cut you off because you were on a roll there and I respect that so much. But you have this kind of victimology constantly portrayed by these types of people and groups. They always say what happened to them during the Second World War. They always, you know, they, they always proclaim this victimology. However, if you look at what happened in the post-war era, for instance, the attacks on the USS Liberty and also the, the treacherous policies taking, you know, against the, the power that supports them for all these years and also the benefits that they have received from the Soviet Union and so on. This makes it very horrifying for us to view for us to view it, you know, because how are we going to react to it? And obviously, we've seen this now. This colonization project is going on, and obviously, they have been so successful in enrolling other entities to be on their side. For instance, like you just mentioned, you know. Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, Qatar, and so on, the Sunni extremists. So obviously we have here a big, big problem because they have their, you know, eyesight on Iran that they want to dismantle as soon as possible. Uh, go, go ahead, my friend. And, and any thoughts on what I said, how you see it from your vantage point to get your perception? Uh, yeah, it's um, I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned that because especially the Soviet era, I mean, there was another super state that they were able to um, exact revenge on their enemies with. Um, there are countless examples of uh, members of the KGB and, and actually Poland. Um, but I've been doing research uh, and Poland has been one of the greatest friends of, um, of this uh, Cuban-American lobby as well. And the amount of uh, uh, torture, murder that they committed against Catholics in, in Poland, especially exactly. um, during during the early uh, Soviet times. I mean, you want to talk about atrocities. These are some of the worst uh, horror stories. There was uh, his last name was Morel, I believe. Um, he committed some of the worst war crimes in history, um, and he was able to uh, flee to. Israel and, and not face uh, any any sort of consequences. So yes, and, and now yeah. they, they do have their their sights set on Iran because what they what they want is to be the uh, hegemon. Even though you mentioned it's a very small country about the size of New Jersey, uh, exactly. a state here in the a state here in the United States with um, a similar uh, population of around uh, nine to twelve million. Yet they want to control a region. Of, of probably upwards of 300 million people. They want to have no rivals in, in the entirety of North Africa and the rest of uh, Southwest Asia, including Iran, which, uh, and, and I know they're upset about this, but uh, Iran is, 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 has been playing its cards masterfully. They haven't totally, um, until recently, it's looking more and more like they're going to uh, sync themselves with uh, China and Russia. But prior but to you know, time, Lamar, a big problem that we have with this, you know, if you look at this scheme, this is a tiny state. I mean, I find it very, from a geopolitical standpoint, I find it highly unlikely that they will become the hegemon. However, what they are doing, which annoys me so much, is that they're able to play out these great powers, you know, against each other so they can benefit themselves. For instance, they're spying on the United States and they're selling information or even handing it out to the Chinese, for instance. They have excellent relationship, relationship with Russia and they have an excellent relationship with, for instance, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, Qatar and so on. And they target Iran once in a while and so on. But overall, they want Iran to go head to head in a confrontation with the United States because that will benefit them too. So this annoys me a lot because we see that they use, they implement this divide and conquer strategy in order to strengthen themselves. And they have done so for quite some time. And I'm kind of, you know, it, it, it has reached a moment that it irritates me. I don't know about you, how you see it, but how is it possible that no one can just see it right through, look, this tiny state is obviously, you know, a culprit too. 
they're not the victims. Go ahead. Any thoughts? Go, yeah. Um, yeah. I, um, it, it also frustrates me to no end, Rudolph. I recently had a comment on my channel. There's actually someone who said, you know, I would support you because this was a whole different topic. But um, he was like, due to your uh, anti-Cuban Americanism, I can't uh, support you. It, it, uh, I don't know. It's like they have... Um, uh, some uh, it's, it's weird. I, I can't describe it. They have a, a, a you, it, 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 monopoly. They have. It, it, they have. They, yeah, they, it's they, a monopoly. Yeah, they have on, on the discord on, because the minute you say something about you know what happened in the past and so on, you get heavily penalized. Not only that, you get heavily penalized, but you. Oh, uh, the sound cut off. Uh oh, there we go. Yeah, sorry. You hear me now? Oh, uh, yes, yes. Now you're coming through. Yes, uh, you, you get heavily penalized. And, and it's, um, they they have the media. And, and, and this is what I've been, been going up against. I think that most people are just, um, and, and then, just like when they uh, divide and conquer uh, via their their enemies uh, on a, on a geopolitical level within societies, they do the same thing. Uh, they it, it's balkanization, and and now they've taken a balkanization international. This which is why they're flooding Western countries, uh, for lack of a better word, with uh, people who are not going to be compatible with those societies. And um, and actually, Russia is kind of uh, going the same way. I saw that um, there's a significant uh, population, minority populations from the former Soviet territories who are kind of uh, running into conflict with the, uh, I guess, uh, for lack of a better word, the white Russians. And um, they do this. They do this globally and uh, they pick groups against each other. And and no one seems to uh, the, the spell is hard to break. Put it that way. It's uh, the media does a great job of of because um, I told this individual who had the, the criticism for me that hey, don't take my word for this. Just they brag about the, their their power that they have, um, and and it's not um, any sort of hatred to point it out. They actually uh, brag about it. Netanyahu, Joel Stein. The list goes on and on where they actually say it. Um, they say the quiet part out loud uh, very often. Well, I'm not getting any sound. This is...